Welcome to the second lecture on pediatric cardiology, where we're now discussing acyanotic heart defects, those that do not make the baby blue. You can imagine this makes them inherently more difficult to catch right away without a proper physical exam. Here are the four acyanotic heart defects we're going to discuss. VSD, ventricular septal defect, an atrial septal defect, ASD, patent ductus arteriosus, PDA, and coarctation of the aorta. This is a rich area for questions on step two, and it's because they're relatively common and a particularly glaring example of where pathology meets physiology. To start this section, let's go through a vignette. Three-year-old female is brought in because her parents say she won't eat anymore. Upon physical examination, a loud pan systolic murmur is appreciated. The child appears small for her age, but her records don't show any maternal or delivery complications. Which of the following is the most likely finding on EKG? Here are your answer options. Now, this is a great question because it introduces a commonly tested topic while showing you the versatility with which they can test that topic. Similar to what you remember probably from step one, step two is going to have questions that are, have two or three steps involved with them. We're not asked the diagnosis in this question. We're asked the findings on an EKG for a diagnosis that's been undeclared. The most effective way to get through questions like these is to pull out what's most effective and what's the most important in the vignette. I wanna highlight that she's got a loud pan systolic murmur because there aren't many causes of that. I then wanna highlight that she's small for her age, indicating that whatever this murmur is related to, it's causing, it's related somewhat to her growth retardation because there are no maternal or delivery complications in this three-year-old's past. So we don't have any other clear reason why she's small. And then it's always a good idea to highlight or pay attention to what you're being asked. We're asked, what's the most likely finding? We're not asked what's possible, we're asked what's most probable. And this is where step two will, will often try to make you mess up because it's gonna give you options that are possible, but it wants to know what's the most probable. So your answer choices are, does this child have right ventricular hypertrophy? right bundle branch block, an ST segment elevation, QT prolongation, or a P wave inversion. Before revealing the reasoning behind all five answer choices and what the correct answer is, let's go through the physiology of what the underlying diagnosis is so that we arrive at the answer together. So this child has a ventricular septal defect, a VSD. To start, let's Let's go through some tips that I want you to commit to memory that are gonna help you get this diagnosis quickly. So if you're put in a situation with a question like this on the test, you can move on to the answer relevant to the question and not be worrying about trying to figure out what the diagnosis is. So some tips you need to know. There are three holosystolic murmurs. There are three pansystolic murmurs. They are mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, and ventricular septal defect. The patient in our case has a loud pansystolic murmur that should immediately trigger this list to you. Pansystolic murmur, holosystolic murmur, think mitral tricuspid regurgitation and a VSD. And that's because um, the, the flow through uh, turbulent flow causes murmurs and VSDs tend to be louder than tricuspid and mitral regurgitation because the smaller a hole, the more turbulent the flow. The more turbulent the flow, the louder the murmur. So loud, loud holosystolic murmurs are more likely to be VSDs in children because mitral valves are big and you're gonna have a, a quieter, more constant holosystolic murmur in those children. So loud pansystolic murmur, think VSD. The second tip is that um, VSDs are the most common congenital heart defect in children. Now recall in the cyanotic heart disease lecture, we learned that Tetralogy of Fallot was the most common cyanotic heart defect in children. It was the most common heart defect that caused blue babies and blue children. This is just the most common heart defect in all kids. So if you wanted to know what the most common heart defect in children was, it'd be VSD. If you wanted to know what the most common heart defect in children that turned blue, it's Tetralogy of Fallot. And they're linked because Tetralogy of Fallot has a VSD as a part of it. So remember the four components of TLF was VSD, pulmonary stenosis, 
right ventricular hypertrophy, and an overriding aorta. Now, it's not uncommon for step two to give you the location of where a particular heart sound was auscultated, which in combination with the facts we mentioned in our vignette can provide greater security in our diagnosis. Here in this picture, we see the locations of where the valves are best auscultated. We're gonna add VSD to this because where mitral valve is heard best in the apex, the tricuspid valve as well as VSD is best appreciated at the left lower sternal border. But that means if you hear a pan-systolic murmur at the left lower sternal border, you now have to differentiate it between VSD and tricuspid regurgitation um, as the cause of your holosystolic murmur based on the clinical context. Tricuspid regurgitation you should associate with an adult with right-sided endocarditis, maybe secondary to IV drug use, or even carcinoid syndrome, which can lead to an aseptic plaque that develops on the tricuspid valve. It's a fairly esoteric thing, but in children, they're less likely to have tricuspid regurgitation compared to a VSD, because as we said, VSD is the most common congenital heart defect in children. We're gonna spend some time now framing our diagnosis and understanding the pathophysiology of VSD and how that relates to the vignette that we discussed. Now, VSD starts out as a left to right shunt. This left to right shunting is why it can go so long without being detected because sending oxygenated blood back through the pulmonary vasculature isn't necessarily a problem in itself. Sending deoxygenated blood through the systemic vasculature is what's bad. And so this is, the op this is opposite of cyanotic heart defects, which is why it's called an acyanotic heart defect. But what this does do over time is that because it's a left to right shunt, it causes left ventricular overload over a long period of time, and that can lead to pulmonary hypertension. And when pulmonary hypertension starts to develop, that's when patients will often present, and they present with dyspnea with distress. Another way of saying it is situational shortness of breath. Depending on what's going on, anytime they have an increased demand for oxygen during distress or exercise or crying, their pulmonary vasculature is already shot. The, the months or years of pulmonary hypertension has made the walls of their pulmonary vasculature at maximal dilation already, and they have zero compliance. They can't get any bigger. They can't increase the amount of blood they're already sending to the lungs. And so when they get into distress, they then start to become short of breath because the demand of their body for oxygen can't be met anymore. And that's when they present to the doctor. This same right ventricular overload that leads to right ventricular hypertrophy causes a loud pulmonic S2. So S2 is made up of the closing of the aorta and the pulmonic valves. The P2, the second part of it, gets louder. And that's because the increased pressure is causing in, in, in the pulmonary artery is slamming the uh, pulmonary valve shut. And then as we've already mentioned, they present with a high-pitched holosystolic murmur as compared with the lower-pitched mitral and tricuspid regurgitations. The tests that are commonly going to be ordered will include a chest x-ray. It's not diagnostically helpful, but every kid that comes in with, you know, uh, you know, shortness of breath, it's going to get a chest x-ray because there are a million other reasons why a kid um, might have shortness of breath. And so they're going to get a chest x-ray. But for your test, chest x-ray is probably not going to be the right answer because if you have a vignette that's making it sound like a congenital heart disease, the best initial test to order is an echo. It's non-invasive and it'll let you see if there's right ventricular hypertrophy, whether there, and you might even be able to see a shunt. You can do bubble studies, those are the things that are going to allow you to see if there is a, a defect in the heart. But the best initial test is not always the most diagnostic test. So the most diagnostic test, the definitive test that will prove that there is a left to right shunt is going to be a cardiac catheterization because that will allow you to measure pressures on the left and right side of the heart. And if you can pass a catheter from the right side to the left side of the heart, well then you definitely have a defect there. So this is where the money is for step two. You need to know what the best initial test is, and you need to know what the most diagnostic test is. And in VSD, you first want to get an echo for sure, and then you want to follow it up with a cardiac cath.
Now with a better understanding of VSD, looking at this information again, we have a loud pansystolic murmur, she's small for her age, and we want to know what's most likely to see on EKG. So let's see if an animation will help us best answer what answer choice is going to be right. In the beginning, VSD is fairly straightforward. You have deoxygenated blood on the right side of the heart, and you have oxygenated blood on the left side of the heart. They meet in the middle where the VSD exists, and because the left side of the heart is thicker, it's stronger, it has to generate greater pressures to send blood through the systemic vasculature, this drives the left to right shunt. So oxygenated blood push will push deoxygenated blood back into the right side and will send a pseudo-oxygenated blood through the pulmonary vasculature and will send more oxygenated blood through the systemic vasculature, which is why this defect can go so many years without being diagnosed. But over time, an uncorrected VSD can lead to a new syndrome, and that's because as the blood is constantly shifted from the left to the right, you develop right ventricular hypertrophy. The right side of the heart gets stronger, and now the shunt can move from a left to right shunt to a right to left shunt, sending partially oxygenated blood to the left side of the heart. And now, instead of a predominantly oxygenated blood going through the aorta and into the systemic vasculature, you have this partially oxygenated blood going to the rest of the system. Sending less oxygenated blood to the rest of the system, giving less oxygen to your organs, can lead to growth retardation. And this is called Eisenmenger syndrome. Eisenmenger syndrome is characterized by the presence of a ventricular septal defect that if unmanaged for years can lead to an irreversible right to left shunting as we just saw in the animation can cause cyanosis and dyspnea during distress. Now with a more thorough understanding of our patient's underlying diagnosis, the ventricular septal defect, we can move into a, an explanation of the answers of our questions. So what's most likely to be on an EKG? What is most likely to be found in a patient with a known VSD in what sounds like Eisenmenger syndrome? Well, we know with the increased left to right shun, the overload on the right side of the heart undoubtedly leads to right ventricular hypertrophy. So that's the answer. Right bundle branch block, it's not impossible, but it's most likely to be seen in those with ASDs or ischemic disease, endocardial ischemic disease, or on the inside. ST segment elevations are seen in myocardial infarctions. I don't think this three-year-old's having a heart attack. QT prolongation is seen in electrolyte disturbances, particularly with potassium, and P wave inversions are seen in atrial arrhythmias. And the vignette doesn't mention anything about irregular heartbeats or irregularly irregular heartbeats, and so that is also less likely. While some of these, if not all of these, are possible, the question is what's most likely, and we know for sure that RVH happens in those with long-term left-to-right shunts and VSDs. Now there are three types of ASD. There's primum, secundum, and sinus venosus. They're more common in males, and the most common type of ACD, ASD is secundum. It is due to a, a failure of the formation of the secondary phase, and fortunate for people who get ASDs, it's less troublesome than the sinus venosus or the primum type. But in case you were thinking about going back and reviewing the development of the atrial septum and embryology, don't do it. It's not worth it. It won't be on step two. Just know that ASDs are pretty common. They're more common in males, and secundum is the most common type. What you do need to know is how these people present. And the truth is, they're usually asymptomatic. When they're discovered, it's often by coincidence when a physician or a clinician picks up a fixed, widely split S2. This is different from physiologic splitting. Recall that physiologically splitting has to do with S2, the second heart sound. Normally, on expiration, there's no split in S2. It's just the aortic valve and the pulmonic valve close at the same time. When you take a deep breath, because of the increased return of blood to the right side of the heart, the pulmonic valve closes a little later. And because of the decreased return to the left side of the heart, the aortic valve closes a little sooner. So you have A2P2 or a little split in inspiration and then not split at all in expiration. That is physiologic splitting. But in ASDs, you have a fixed wide split S2 throughout inspiration and expiration, and that can be heard all the time. So that is 
sort of the uh, pathognomonic sign for ASD, particularly on your test. The uh, test you're going to order in people with suspected ASDs is the same as VSD. The first best test is going to be the non-invasive, easy one to do that can be done practically at the bedside, and it's an echo. If you're given a choice between echo and echo with bubble study, go with bubble study. And then the best diagnostic test, the most diagnostic test, is cardiac catheterization. You need to know the difference between the best initial test and the most diagnostic test for every disease you can think of when it comes to step, test, uh, step two. And the prognosis for these people is great. They usually close on their own without any intervention, um, and only if they have symptoms or they start to develop uh, right atrial hypertrophy will you then want to think about closing it surgically. ASDs, if they remain uncorrected, can lead to symptoms in some cases. They usually remain asymptomatic because they're usually small, but those that eventually cause symptoms from left to right shunting will cause atrial enlargement. Atrial enlargement leads to problems with the SA node and can lead to an ectopic pacemaker and cause arrhythmias and dysrhythmias from the stretch. As the atrium gets bigger, stretches it out, you then all of a sudden have different, different pacing at different parts of the atrium and this leads to problems embolic risk. So DVT comes up your leg and instead of going from the right atrium to the right ventricle and just causing a PE, which is bad enough, it can fly across the left side of the heart and then end up causing a stroke. So the treatment, if it's you find an ASD in somebody and they're asymptomatic and they have no signs of right atrial hypertrophy and no issues, leave it alone. There are those that will need surgery though and those that need surgery will be anybody who has symptoms, anybody who has uh, an arrhythmia they can't tolerate, a, an arrhythmia that is uh, life-threatening, or if they've ever had an embolic issue, you know, they end up having a stroke or they've had embolic infarcts of any of their organs, they need to have their ASD patch to prevent future issues. Now, ductus arteriosus is a normal thing in a newborn, but it typically closes within the first 12 hours of being born due to oxygen tension increasing in the blood. But if it doesn't close in those first 12 hours, and if it's open by the, uh, by the end of the first day, then it's considered a persistently, pos uh, persistently patent ductus arteriosus, and you need to use some intervention to close it because it leads to a left-to-right shunt. Now, the reason it causes this left-to-right shunt is because the systemic vasculature, the aorta, the left side of the heart has greater pressures than the right side of the heart and the pulmonary vasculature. The moment those lungs open up in that baby, the moment that baby comes out of the womb, takes a big breath of fresh air and expands the lungs, the intrathoracic pressure drops, the pressure in the pulmonary vasculature drops, and that creates the pressure differential between the left side and the right side. The pressure differential between the systemic vasculature and the pulmonary vasculature. And because of that, if the ductus arteriosus is still open, because it connects the aorta and the pulmonary artery, blood will flow from the aorta to the pulmonary artery. And that will lead to oxygenated blood going to the lungs and getting reoxygenated again when it doesn't need to, and it leads to symptoms. So our left to right shunt in our presentation is a machine-like murmur because regardless of whether we're in diastole or systole, regardless of the heart cycle, you're always gonna have blood flowing to, in some way through that PDA. We also have wide pulse pressures, which we'll explain more, but because of the PDA, there's increased backflow, and that leads to a lower diastolic pressure and then higher systolic pressures, and leading to a gap. And for the same reason, the reasons you have a wide pulse pressure will lead to bounding pulses. We'll explain this again in our next animation. The test you're going to order, it's similar to for a lot of the congenital heart diseases. The best initial test is an echo. Anytime we look at the heart, we've got great ultrasounds. You can throw them right on the chest and you can take a good look at what you see. Sometimes you can see the PDA. But the most diagnostic test is going to continue to be a cardiac catheterization. That's putting a wire into the arteries and looking at the pressures. The treatment, this is not surgical, so this is key. Surgery is going to be an option on your test, but surgery is not the answer. 
NSAIDs. Particularly, you should know that indomethacin is a potent NSAID. We give it to close the PDA. This is our patent ductus arteriosus animation that's going to help explain why we have the wide pulse pressures and why we have the bounding pulses. The machine-like murmur is, as we said, is because there's always going to be a pressure differential between the left side and the aorta and the right side in the pulmonary vasculature. Now normally, the blood leaves the left ventricle and it goes through the aorta and into the systemic circulation as normal. The same thing happens here in the PDA. And then what defines your diastolic pressure is when blood flows back and stops in the aorta because you have an aortic, aortic valve there. This backflow and the stoppage of it, this is what creates your diastolic blood pressure. This is how you get the, the big number over the little number. And if you have an extra valve open somewhere, if you have a leak, then more blood flows backwards than it's intended to. Some, if it leaks into the pulmonary vasculature as it does in the PDA, it creates a lower than expected diastolic blood pressure. Because blood won't be moving forward as expected, as expected through the systemic system, the left ventricle now will start compensating by pumping harder during systole, creating an elevated systolic blood pressure. So the wide pulse pressure seen in PDAs is because of the increased systolic blood pressure from the overworked left ventricle and the decreased diastolic blood pressure from the leak through the PDA. The bounding pulse is from the increased thrust of the th left ventricle trying to compensate for this lack of forward flow. The last congenital anomaly we're going to discuss is coarctation of the aorta. Now, coarct usually occurs around the area where the ductus arteriosus inserts itself into the aorta. This happens after the cephalic branches break off, the, the right brachiocephalic, the subclavian, etc. This is a good thing because then in utero, the developing fetus, the brain isn't deprived of well oxygenated blood. But this also is explains why it's not presenting as early right after birth and presents later on. That's because the ductus arteriosus starts to close over time and actually closes from the end of the pulmonary artery. So with time, as the pulmonary, the ductus arteriosus closes and it gets closer to closure of the aorta, it actually makes the coarc even worse. So that's why they tend to present a little bit later down the road. You have to know that coarctation of the aorta is associated with Turner syndrome. This is something commonly tested by the NBME and on step one, two, and probably under step three somewhere. So think of female, amenorrhea, webbed neck, short stature, think Turner syndrome if they have an elevated blood pressure you know, in their upper extremities, coarctation of the aorta. Now the presentation, as we said, is gonna be differential blood pressure, not from left to right, and not from right to left, but from upper body and lower body. The coarctation takes place after the cephalic blood vessels break off of the aorta, leading to elevated blood pressures in both your arms and lower blood pressures in your legs. But blood pressure in the leg isn't tested all that often. So often if you are taking someone's blood pressure from their leg, then you're already suspicious of a coarct. In general, they have hypertension, but it's not true hypertension in the sense that their uh, essential hypertension all over the body, it's secondary hypertension to this coarctation. They can develop congestive heart failure because of the increased work of the left ventricle against this coarct, this increased resistance leads to left ventricular hypertrophy, dilatation, eventually they have backflow of blood into the, uh, the pulmonary system leading to respiratory distress. The tests, this is gonna be the same as it's been for all the congenital heart diseases so far, you want to start with an echo because it's a good place to start. There's a lot you can visualize of the heart and maybe of the associated vasculature. And the most diagnostic test is going to be a cardiac cath because you'll directly be able to detect the differential blood pressure at the point where the coarc exists. Here's a diagram of a heart with a coarctation. You can see that the narrowed part of the aorta is right by where the ductus arteriosus has closed and is now connecting uh, the aorta in the pulmonary artery, and it occurs after the three cephalic vessels branch off.
because coarchs are typically after these vessels, like I, we've already mentioned, the brain continues to develop normally because it's receiving the appropriate blood supply.